He's not going to get away from the place he is now. We want to look around a little bit more, ma'am. May we come in? Well, I don't know. That is... There's somebody in there. No, no, I'm not alone. Farley, Farley, we're coming in. You can't, you can't. Oh, look there. No, you don't. Stop where you are or I'll let you have it. Uh, what is the matter? I'll be in such a hurry to get away. You want to talk to you? Yeah, who are you? You know who we are. Police officers. What's your name? We don't Charlie. You're lying. It's Madrano. This is another bird we've been looking for for some time, Eddie. You guys aren't doing bad today. No, sometimes we have lucky days, and this is one of them. You're under arrest, Madrano. Oh, but what for? I have done nothing. You've done enough for our purposes. Uh, but you cannot do this. Sit down, Madrano. Take it easy. Uh, but I... Sit down. Keep an eye on him, Eddie. Okay. Come on, Tom. Let's look in this cabinet here. Maybe we can find some more junk. Okay. Nothing on these shelves. Look up there on that top shelf. I can't reach it. Wait a minute. Stand on this drawer. There, that's more like it. Find anything? Yeah. Say, here's a couple of bottles of... I'd better get to that drawer before Mrs. Farley gets there. where you are. I'll answer. Speedy, Speedy, look out. Shut up, you know. Hey, what's he hollering about? I don't know. Keep him quiet till I find out who this is. What's the matter, Eddie? Fitz entered the door. There was a shot, and he ran outside. Oh, come on. There's somebody over there with a step to that door. Oh, he's here. Oh, it's Fitz. What's the matter, Fitz? He's out there. Oh. Oh. Call an ambulance quick, Eddie. He's hurt bad. rushed to the hospital and submitted to an emergency operation for the removal of the bandit's bullets from his liver. But he never rallied. And in a few hours, he is dead. Outraged by the death of their comrade in arms, Tom O'Brien and Chief of Police Lewis Oak questioned the suspects taken in the raid earlier in the day. They deny any knowledge of the identity of Fitzgerald Slayer. The officers are despairing as the last of the suspects shows no sign of breaking. Come on now, Taylor. You know who did this job. I don't know a thing. Well, we'll question you until you drop. We'll never give you any rest. It won't do you no good. How do I know who croaked this dick? Might have been anybody. Yes, it might, but it wasn't. And you know who did it. At least you've got a mighty good suspicion. Even if I have, I wouldn't tell you guys. Now listen, Taylor. This isn't going to do you any harm to help us. One of our best friends has just been killed. And we intend to find out who did it. It ain't on a mile, sir. Yeah, but we've got to get a lead. Now, you're not putting yourself on the spot if you give us a hunch. Tell us something, anything. Well, I think maybe the guy you want is out on parole. Out on parole? What else? Listen, that's all you're going to get out of me. Thanks, Taylor. That's all we need. Tom, get Langham, the state patrol officer, down here. Put Langham, the state patrol officer, down here. But it's 2 a.m., Walter Chief. I don't care what time it is. Get him out of bed. And get him down here as soon as possible. Routed out of bed, the state parole officer rushes to the chief's office, bringing with him a mug book containing pictures of all parole prisoners. Chief Oak calls Madrano into his office, and placing the mug book on his lap, turns it slowly page by page as a circle of Hawkeye detectives watch the criminal's face for the slightest change of expression. Now look carefully, Madrano. Is this the man that shot Fitzgerald? No. Is this him? Is this him? No. How about this one? That caramba let up on me. I don't know who did it. Is this the man who shot the kill? No. Is this the man who shot the kill? No. Is this the guy? <laughs> no. I tell you, I don't know who did it. Okay, Madrano. Take him back to the cell, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I'm on the bar. I'm on the bar. Did you, see him, did you see him jump when I showed him that picture? Yeah, there's no doubt about it, Chief. He gave himself away. Okay. Here's that man. Let's see. Bill Alwyn. Alias Little Phil, alias Arizona Phil. 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 Say, he yelled something like that just before Fitz opened the door, like he wanted to warn the guy. 
He said, Feely, Feely. Yeah, this is the guy, all right. And say, get this. He has an insignia Arizona Phil tattooed on his left arm. Boys, I'm going to track down this man if it takes me the rest of my life. Chief Oak proceeds to make good his oath. His work comprises one of the most fascinating stories in the record of police manhunt. He travels over 9,000 miles. A drag net is thrown around Little Phil's hangout. His picture is broadsided all over the city and to every police department in the United States. But Little Phil disappears, leaving behind here, leaving behind him but one sign characteristic of the braggadocia of the diminutive Mexican killer. Mexican killer. Can working on him, but he seems to have disappeared into thin air. I just got a note from him. He did? Yeah. Listen to this. I'm telling you the truth. That I shot Detective Fitzgerald. Shot Detective Fitzgerald. But don't hunt me anymore because my life is worth it. If you keep on hunting me, I'll kill all the officers and I'll be gone. I'm hiding somewhere in town, but you'd never find me. If you do find my hiding place, your men would be killed at once for my pals. And it's sent for my pals. And it's signed, Little Phil. Oh, that's just a nut letter. No, it isn't, Tom. I checked the handwriting. Little Phil, all right. He's got a lot of nerve after you to come and get him. And that's just what we're going to do. That's just what we're going to do. <laughs> emphatic prophecy does not come true. And although police vigilance never relaxes, police vigilance never relaxes, months drag on, and no trace of little Phil Algren is discovered. Algren is discovered. Discovered. And then one day, outside the main ring of a circus playing in a small town in Idaho, two clowns are arguing just before they go on with their act. Dallas, if you treat me up again on the run-in, you'll get what's coming to me. Ah, what's eating your pay, though? Just a laugh, doesn't it? I'm not saying any more I warn you. Pipe down. Here we go. In the fall of 1922, more than a year after the murder of Detective Fitzgerald, three shadowy figures wade across the Rio Grande River two miles south of El Paso. Violently, they slink behind the kills of the El Paso brickyard and crouch near the paymaster's office. Then, as the sound of an automobile is heard, they stiffen with suppressed excitement. Here he comes now. You covered his eyeball, Jose. Si. You hammer the nails into his heart, Manuel. Si. And I will get the money out of the back of the car. You all set? We're looking for it. Okay. Get out there on the road. Keep him up. What is it? Ah, shut up. You want to keep your health. Here goes the first one, amigo. Ah, bueno. Ah, he's damn doy stuck. Ah, there we are. 
Well, you are thoughtful, my friend. I see you have brought all the money. Huh? You can't do this. Stop, stop. We are doing it, ain't we? <laughs> it's good enough. We can't get far with the two flat tires. Come on, amigos. Adios, senor. <laughs> But this time, the wily Phil was so careless as to leave a fingerprint on the door of the automobile. El Paso police identified the robber as little Phil Aldwin and informed Chief Oak of his suspected whereabouts in Juarez. The chief leaves immediately for El Paso after instructing the Texan police to place Mexican detectives on the killer's trail. Upon Chief Oak's arrival in El Paso, it is decided to have Algwin arrested by the Mexican police and turned over to the American officers on the International Bridge. Chief Oaks accompanies the Mexican detectives to a cantina frequented by Algwin to witness the arrest. Algwin, you are under arrest. What for? Vagrancy. Vagrancy? <laughs> That's a good one. You think I'm not? Who's the gringo with you? That is of no matter. Will you come peaceably or will I have to handcuff you? Oh, I'll come peaceably. Let's go. Now, what's the idea of the car? We can walk to the jail. I prefer that we ride. <laughs> okay, pal. Your gringo friend riding with you? Seguro. Uh, I thought so. Well, let's go. don't think you'll get me across the bridge, do you? I do not know what you are talking about. Yeah, of course you don't. Well, it looks like this is the end of the ride. What do you mean? Arrested! Arrested! What is the matter? Where are you taking this man? He is under arrest. But the jail is that way, not the way you are going. This man is my prisoner, Captain. He's wanted in Los Angeles for murder. I intend to take him back there. I regret very much, senor, but you cannot do that. This man is a Mexican citizen. You cannot take him out of the country without the proper papers from your government in Washington. But the American government doesn't recognize the present government in Mexico. I couldn't get activation papers. That, senor, is not my problem. It is yours. Come on, Gilipi. You are not under the U.S. What did I tell you guys? You can't touch me! Discouraged by this unexpected turn of events, Chief Oak spends weeks tracing Phil Algwin's birthplace. At last, he establishes it as Moranti, Arizona, and obtains copies of the killer's birth certificate. Now he must attempt to get Algwin deported from Mexico as an undesirable alien. But obstacle after obstacle is encountered at every turn. Finally, Chief Oak calls in Sam Drebin, World War hero and famous soldier of fortune. The one man in El Paso who knows the border best. Well, Louis, the way I see it, your problem is to get Phil across the river. Yeah, and what a problem. Well, there's some way to pull it. I can't get any cooperation with the officials on the other side. You never can. They don't know who their boss is from one day to the next, the way the government changes. But there must be a way. Now, let me think. I got it. What is it? Did you know that Phil was over on this side some time ago and tried to get Doc Isaacs to remove a tattoo mark from his arm? No. And it's a fact. The doc said he'd get cold feet when it came to a showdown and refused to do the job. Now, there's your angle. How do you mean? Well, Phil seems mighty anxious to get that tattoo off his arm. Well, I should think he was. That's the best identification mark he has. Okay. Let's set up a tattoo removing business and warrants. Hey, what the devil are you talking about? It's simple. Now, I've got a pal in town that looks like a doctor. His name is Kelly, and he's really one of the toughest fighting Irishmen you'd want to meet up with. Now... We'll send Kenny over to the other side with some tools to set up a business as a tattoo remover. And then we'll get word to roundabouts to Phil that Kelly's just the man to take off that mark. And when he's got a little joke shot into him, uh, supposedly to ease the pain, it'll be a cinch to get him in a car and across the bridge. Well, it's worth a try. I'm going to take that little monkey back to Los Angeles with me. And I don't care much how I do it. <laughs> The trap is laid, and little Phil falls for the bait. 
he instructs Dr. Kelly to come to his room to remove the tattoo. When Kelly enters the building, Drebin, Chief Oak, and the El Paso Chief Detective, Claude Smith, are awaiting outside for Kelly's signal to come and get the killer. But Kelly, when he enters Phil's room, encounters unforeseen difficulties in the person of Phil's dusty-eyed sweetheart, Carmen Peter. Hello, Doc. <laughs> all set for the operation? Yep, I've got all the stuff right here. He's Carmen Peter, Doc. <laughs> My little ball of fire. <laughs> Charm, senorita. Thank you, senor doctor. I am happy to meet you. Now, if there was a young lady of partners, we can get started. What do you mean? You must wait outside until I'm through. Oh, no, no, it is impossible. I must be with my little team when he has his tattoo taken off. I can't work with anyone present. <laughs> oh, this thing, no. We will come and see, tell you we should work better, no? Ah, let us say, <laughs> Doc. What's the art? Well, I'm afraid I can't do a good job with anybody here. Ah, it's okay. All right, if you say so. It's going to hurt you, Phil. I don't mind. You don't know. Yeah. It'll be necessary to remove several layers of the epidermis. Well, I don't care what to remove, Doc, so long as you take that damn mark off of me. I think I'd better give you a local anesthetic so it won't hurt so much. Okay, just as you say, Doc. I have it right here. Now, all you feel is the jab of the needle. Oh. oh. Now you don't feel anything as the Novocaine goes in, do you? No. Feels okay now, Doc. What's the matter with you? I? Nothing is the matter with me. Oh, look at you. You're pale and your eyes are feverish. I feel nothing. Perhaps watching the injection has made you think. Why, no, why... Be careful. You're unsteady on your feet. But, doctor... Sit down here. Yes, I know all the symptoms. You're really ill. Well, I was all right a minute ago. But you're not now. Well, no, I... I guess I do feel a little dizzy. Here, take this glass of medicine. That'll make you feel better. Yes, sir. Oh, 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 it's good. Well, it will do you good. Oh, oh, that horrible stuff. I'm going to. You better go outside, Senorita. Hurry, the back way. Well, that's that. Give you plenty sick, but it won't hurt her any. How about it, Phil? Can you hear me? the driver are intercepted by the border guards, and the three Americans menaced by a mob eager to lynch them are housed in the Juarez jail, while little Phil, with a bullet scratch in his temple, is taken to the hospital. Chief Oak, left behind by the others in the excitement of the getaway, makes his escape through back streets toward the border. An obliging American drives him across the bridge, and under cover of darkness, the guards miss the suspicious appearance of his blood and mud-stained clothing. From his hospital cot. Little Phil again both. This time to a newspaper reporter. I'm too smart for these cheap cops. I beat them twice. I can do it again. But say, Bobby, this handling gets on that guy's nerves. He ain't anywhere for a smart crook like me to leave. I wasn't born a crook. The police made me one. I got more respect for those Los Angeles flat feet and for these heat. 
You will pass all people foot badges on. Listen, I know every one of them, and I'm so kidding with them. The next time they try to get me, I am going to be ready for them. I'm going to have half a dozen dead bulls if they come after me again. At first, I pumped off his girl up in law. <laughs> What's a couple of bulls, more or less? I'll pump off every bull that gets in my way from now on. As the little Phil Algren case takes on the importance of an international incident, no less a dignitary than the governor of Chihuahua travels north in a private train to take over the investigation of the case. Keith Oakes is awaiting him at the hotel in El Paso when a Mexican drug asks to see him. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I am Tomas. I am Boticario. Hmm? A drug. Yeah. See, I have here a prescription for a patient at the Libertad Hospital in Juarez. His name is Alguin. Felipe Alguin. You know him, no? Yeah, I know him. Oh, he is no good, this Alguin. Look, I have here a great power in this prescription. Senor, if you say the word, I shall make this prescription like it should be. What do you mean? <laughs> I mean I will put poison into this prescription. This Malombre Alguin will die. No one shall know. No, thanks so much. I, uh, I've had offers like that before, but I'd rather take him back alive. But, senor, is the easy way to settle the whole thing. One little pinch of the right powder and pour. <laughs> He's out of the way forever. Very kind of you, to make. I want to help. But I'm afraid I can't accept your offer. Very well, senor, but I think you make a big mistake. This arguing should be killed quick and good. The governor of Chihuahua to see you, senor. I'll show him in, please. Please, si, senor. Now, you'll pardon me, too, Matt, but I have a very important interview. Good, sure, senor. But if you ever want my assistance, sorry. I shall be glad to. <laughs> All right, Thomas. If I need you, I'll call you. Adios, senor. Adios. Adios, Thomas. Come in, Governor. Come in. Yeah, buenos dias, senor. Good day. May I introduce myself, Governor? I'm Lou Yokes of the Los Angeles Police Department. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Well, thank you. You were very kind to come see me. Not at all, senor. I have heard much of the fine police work you and your department perform. Well, it's good of you to say so, Governor, but let's get down to business. May you say, Senor? Uh, Governor, I want you to deport uh, Philip Alguin. I want him for murder. Yes, I understand that, Senor. But as he is a Mexican citizen, and your country unhappily does not recognize mine, I do not I've see... Heard, uh, I've heard that explanation before, Governor, but it isn't so. Alguin is an American citizen. It has never been proved, Senor. Here's the proof. Here's his birth certificate. Born in Arizona. Look yourself. Hmm. It does seem to be so. It is so, Governor. And now, since he's a known and confessed murderer, an American citizen, it follows that he's an undesirable alien in your country. There is something in what you say. And being an undesirable alien, he should be deported. You place him across the international bridge, and my men will be there to arrest him. That seems to be perfectly regular. Then you will do it? See, si, senor. When? I will deliver him into your hands tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. But at 8.30, the following morning, the governor of Chihuahua left Juarez for Chihuahua City with Philip Alguin and placed him in the penitentiary there, hoping to win the reward for himself. Great pressure was brought to bear through interested Los Angeles newspapers on President Obregon of Mexico. And finally, on February 7th, 1923, almost two years after he had murdered Fitzgerald, Alguin was landed from an oil tanker at Freeport, Texas. Arrested by Chief Louis Oakes, and rapidly returned to Los Angeles to face the bar of justice. He pled guilty to his crime, and in consideration for this plea, was sentenced to San Quentin for life. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
Ladies and gentlemen, when you are buying a new car, you don't just take the word of the advertisement, do you? Of course not. In fact, you insist on taking rides in the various cars. You are not satisfied with claims alone. You want absolute proof. Why not decide on your brand of gasoline in this same manner? Let proof and not mere claims decide for you. All advertising for Rio Grande Crack with tetraethyl is based on proved facts, not high-sounding and confusing claims. Rio Grande Crack has just recently started its second consecutive year as the official fuel of Los Angeles. It has come through nobly in the grueling test of thousands upon thousands of miles in police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency equipment. Before you purchase your next tank full of gasoline, consider this statement of fact. More police cars, fire engines, ambulances, motorcycles, and other emergency equipment in Southern California and Arizona are powered with Rio Grande Crack than all other brands combined. And for finer lubrication, try famous Sinclair Opaline motor oil. Sinclair Opaline has several advantages. It is extra refined, giving longer life. It is sold in extra major tamper-proof cans. And Sinclair Opaline costs you no more than ordinary bulk oil. Rick Lindsley saying good night for the Rio Grande 